it, it's pretty crammed. I'm going to go through at a rate of knots, so please forgive it. Sacred geography, we'll look at some different types of sacred geography. Um, and what is sacred geography? Good question. Uh, what well, sacred geography is, it's the meeting of physical landscape, topography, and the human mind and spirit and soul, whatever you want, geographies of the soul, if you like. And it's a meeting of those two elements. And as I shall say at the end, with a dramatic picture, that we, um, what, what ancient peoples did, they invested their landscape with meaning. And uh, as a, generally, as a culture, we don't do that now. And I'll come back to that. Magical mindscapes, uh, sacred geography, however you want to describe it. Um, the, um, most sacred geographies, plural, are uh, either visual and, or auditory or a bit of both. But they can use other sensory things, and I'll just mention this in passing. <laughs> uh, for example, on this uh, Sawieki in one, on one of the Fijian islands, there's a sacred place, it's a beach, and uh, the sand smells like vanilla. And because of that scent, natural scent there, it, it became imbued with, with meaning, with uh, spiritual significance. So, there can be many things that will trigger a sacred geography. But I thought we'd look at about seven or eight different types of sacred geography. Uh, the first being what I call the topography of myth, venerated natural places. Uh, because the first geographies, the first sacred geography, if you like, was the unadulterated land itself. And people living in different landscapes would gravitate towards particular features in the landscape which they would imbue with the sacred where they would go and get a sense of the numinous and, um, and these were the first sacred places. Uh, Levi Brule said of the Australian or Australasian Aborigine, the land is a living book in which the myths are inscribed. A legend is captured in the very outlines of the landscape. And as I say, he was saying that about Australasian Aboriginal peoples, uh, but he could have said it about any Aboriginal peoples anywhere in the world. Their myths, they lived amongst their mythic imagery. Okay, what sort of sites would acquire this numinous power or have a numinous power that attracted people? Well, we'll start right where we are. What was a good idea? Uh, landmarks various types of landmarks, things that stuck out in the landscape would naturally attract the attention of people living in those landscapes. And we know here at Glastonbury, I mean, the Tor is quite a distinctive landmark and it becomes the focus for myth and legends. And we all know that sort of soft luminosity that occurs here. And uh, it has a magical, the Isle of Avalon and all the rest of it. I'll tell you an interesting legend that's associated. I mean, it was the last, supposedly the last place uh, for the King of the Fairies. Uh, it was the entrance to Anun, the Celtic underworld or other world. But it's an interesting feature you may or may not know about. But you know Cadbury Castle is about 12 miles away believed to be the site of the actual historical Camelot. Uh, but on the, uh, there's a legend, it certainly goes back to the 15th century, and possibly much, much older, Geoffrey Ash said it's much older, um, that says that King Arthur will ride out of Cadbury Castle and uh, lead the wild host. And you know the legend of the wild host, it's all over Europe. In, in medieval and early medieval and even earlier times, the idea of a, a furious, furious host of spirits led by some charismatic a god, a hero figure, a goddess, whatever, and they would whoosh through the landscape, picking up anybody that was very ill or on their deathbeds or whatever, and take the souls with them. 
And indeed, this was greatly feared in, in medieval times. And there are actual instructions of how not to be taken by the wild hose. And in case you need to know, and ever in that position, you lie on your back and you cross your arms like that, like some Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, and they might pass over with a bit of luck. Close your eyes, by the way. So uh, it shoots over you. And they, what they did here, between Cadbury Castle, they went to the tour to deliver the souls they picked up to the mouth of Annan. So they delivered to the underworld. And King Arthur was, was at the head. So it's at least half a millennium old, that legend, and maybe much older. Now, what's interesting, uh, archaeological digs on Cadbury Castle have revealed, you know, the remains of uh, sort of uh, what might have been the old Camelot, a great fortified structure and citadel. But in the last few years, they, they excavated a burial site of early Bronze Age, much older, much older, sort of 2000 BC, 1800 BC. And it was the burial of a large male, I had his bones there, and he was buried in a ritual boat. And it was on the side of Cadbury Castle, the faces, uh, the tour, which is perfectly visible on the skyline. Uh, so it's a landmark. And the prow of this boat, the pointy end, pointed to the tour. So it looked like, and, and if, you, if you remember the, the legends, the romances, the Arthurian romances, that the, the dying Arthur is put in a fairy bark and taken to the, the land of immortal souls. And uh, one can only wonder if that early Bronze Age burial of this very tall fellow uh, was really where that element of the Arthurian romances began long, long ago, thousands of years ago. It's known that there's Iron Age mythology encoded in the Arthurian romance, but my guess is it goes back further. But anyway, so the wild host runs down there. You've got this curious archaeological linkage pointing to the top. And in fragments along the way of the wild host, there are actual old trackways, sections of trackways, that mark out exactly the same course. So we get a sense that there's a multi-layered mythological patina over this landscape that relates to this particular landmark. And then we know what the Christians did. Uh, and there they are. Um, so it's, it's natural places, venerated places, attracted uh, the attention of early peoples and, and through the ages, mythological filters built over them. Another type of sacred, natural sacred place, of course, were, were sacred peaks. This is just an excuse to show this painting by Nicholas Rurick. Beautiful, it always fascinates me. Um, what do we have? Sacred peaks. Oh, Mount Shasta, California, Northern California. It's a sacred uh, peak to the Wintu Indi Indians who live in the territory. And their, their tradition is that when you die, your soul travels to the peak of uh, Mount Shasta, and then off to heaven. And there's a secret geography around here. There are little rocks set up on perching on the edges of cliffs and so on. They are markers, and they're markers for the soul of dead people, so they can find them and um, get, find their way. Similar ideas in Oceania. Uh, Kiribati has places where the soul goes in a straight line to the place of dread, and that's a marked route through the landscape. Other examples of, of, of sacred peaks, um, Mount Siloritis, the old Mount Ida in Crete, the temple palace of Phaistos, the lines to it, and there's a whole thing about cleft or saddle peaks um, uh, in, in Crete and Greece generally. Uh, and these are uh, significant features. You see there's a sort of black hole there. That's the sacred cave of Comares. So you've got uh, a double significance here. If you go on to mainland uh, Greece, 
uh, the, 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 those Greeks picked up stuff from the Minoans who occupied Crete and they built stuff underneath cleft peaks. So, for example, this is the Temple of Eleusis and it's overlooked by Mount Karata, which is a very significant, powerful cleft peak. And Eleusis, of course, was the mystery temple of ancient Greece uh, where they probably drank ergotized beer, uh, natural LSD, and went through great rituals, and Plato and Pythagoras, all of them went through this. And it was said that those who went through this initiation um, never feared death afterwards. Back on Crete, uh, if we take the site of Knossos, the temple um, palace, that's overlooked by Mount Juctus also a cleft peak and uh, if you go up there Charla and I did one day and got beaten back by Zeus with thunderbolts coming down on all sides but we went up again this time he let us get up there and you get to that top the peak there's there's a rock big summit rock and there's a fissure another one of these fissures again one of these cracks and long before the Minoans came in the Bronze Age the Neolithic inhabitants of Crete were throwing votive objects into that uh, crack. So there was already mountain worship going on, but when the, the uh, Minoans got there, they put an altar up on this one, and they slightly walled in, they keyed in walling into the natural rock there, and made a, a, a summit shrine. And there are 22 such peaks on the island of Crete. What is interesting, uh, Vincent Scully, the American art historian, suggested many years ago, he reckoned that the horns of consecration, this symbol that occurs time and again in archaeological uh, studies of, of, of the Minoans, he thinks that was probably inspired by the horned or cleft peak mountains, in which case it means that the landscape actually contributed to Minoan iconography another way the land can speak. I uh, thought I'd show you this one. Uh, the Inca were also great mountain worshippers, and uh, as you doubtless know, that they found mummified bodies of children at 20,000 feet or whatever of some of the, uh, the mountain peaks. And um, some of them had been allowed to die of uh, cold heavily sedated with coca, um, or they've been hit over the back of the head, more bluntly, um, and, and, and offerings laid. Um, so there were sacrifices to the mountains. But less well known is that uh, in the Andes, the um, various groups of uh, the Inca would uh, deform their heads. But their heads were deformed so they took on the shape, the outline, of their particular sacred peak. So it might be pointy, it might be flat-topped, or it could be rounded, as you see there. So they actually carried the image of the mountain around in the shape of their skulls. Not a lot of people know that. Um, okay, so mountain peaks, obviously. Uh, water places also became sacred to many peoples around the world, of course. Waterfalls, springs, rivers, bends in rivers sometimes became sacred. And the ancient Celts uh, considered waterfalls, springs, and wells to be entrances to Anam, the underworld. Celtic seers would wrap themselves in animal skins and sleep next to the waterfalls in order to have prophetic dreams. And if you've ever slept next to a waterfall, uh, you know you can hear sounds like voices calling and so on. It's a fabulous pink or white noise background into which all sorts of things uh, can be heard. Uh, and you do have interesting dreams. Uh, another thing about water, again quite close to here, of course, is Bath in England, a, a pagan site, became a Roman holy site. And it also then became a spa in Regency times. The water comes from, uh, this is a Roman aqueduct underneath the thing here. And uh, the water comes out from the Mendips. Uh, that water is radioactive. 
Uh, we'd heard that people have said it was, and we actually conducted measurements there a good many years ago on the Dragon Project, and it is radioactive water. Uh, not radioactive in Three Mile Island sense, of course, but, you know, it's five times background, six times background. And I've often wondered if there's a sort of homeopathic dose uh, of, of radiation that could have healing effects. But I'm not recommending it. I don't want to be sued. Anyway, very early on, of course, and we all know this, caves came to be considered as sacred places. And we know that they left their paintings, and we talked this morning a bit about the acoustics in there. Uh, and you only have to think of the sound in caves and the darkness, sensory deprivation, sound, mysterious noises, uh, and the idea of them becoming ritual places. They were the first cathedrals. Uh, there's both a, a, a cave and a water place here, the uh, Balancanche Cave <coughs> and the Yucatan, not far from Chichen Itza. And uh, that's water, it's an under, underground lagoon. And uh, they, the Mayans went down there um, to collect what they call virgin water, pure water that had never seen daylight, had not come running out and running all over the place. <coughs> Excuse me. So they collected this. They also, in the same cave, actually, you go past uh, stalactites under which there are stone uh, bowls and so on that collected the drops of water coming, dripping off. And this was virgin water as well. All sorts of votive offerings thrown in there as well. And I'll show you something else from that cave in a, in a few minutes. What I will tell you uh, is that Either there's not much oxygen, well, there's not much oxygen down there, and I'm not sh sure that the rocks aren't giving off something, but anyway, if you're down there for about 15, 20 minutes, you suddenly find yourself not breathing air anymore, and it can get quite scary. And uh, I thought I was going to die, but we got out. Uh, but it's very strange, and I wonder if that was also an element in sort of altered states and so on. Yeah, another type of uh, site were was uh, trees. We know the, uh, uh, the Minoans uh, worshipped, had sacred trees. Um, and we know from the Sea Henge case where the tide uncovered this uh, ring, timber ring with a, with a tree bowl uh, inverted, put down in the middle. Um, uh, so we know the trees and so on were uh, worshipped. But of course, they're organic, and by and large, they don't last over thousands of years. And there's been discussion that the stones of Stonehenge, some of them have, uh, well, they've got mortise and tenon joints for the lintels, but some of them have tongue and groove as well. And uh, so they were treated like timber, and we know there were loads of timber circles around. They found the post holes of them. Uh, so trees, timber, and so on also were natural sacred places a memory of the sacred tree of the maypoles or maybaums. Uh, this is a maybaum in uh, Berkshire in Germany. Uh, this is a maypole in, uh, in Padstow. And this is a memory of the sacred tree. Then what happened in different times, in different places, that these natural venerated places began to come slightly embellished. So there might be rock art carved on part of a, of a rock face or the bottom of a mountain or um, objects would be made from, from the rocks of these places, the soil or whatever, or very low retaining walls. If you go to see the tours on, uh, on Bodmin Moor, for example, you look very carefully, you can see very subtle retaining walls around some of them. They were a natural sacred place as well. And, uh, and so it goes. Okay, the second type of Sacred geography involves what I call places with faces, uh, and these are simulacra, things that look like something like face, a poodle in a cloud, or a face on, in the bark of a tree, or whatever. An accidental simulacrum looks like something else uh, without apparently intelligent design. So, for example, uh, the paps of Anu, paps, ancient word for breasts, um, and uh, the goddess Anu, this is near Kalani in Ireland, uh, where they used to, I think still do actually, dance at Lunasa. 
and um, this was the goddess in the landscape. Uh, are there examples? I'm just giving you a handful of very few examples, you understand that. Uh, this is Buffalo Rock in, in Manitoba, and uh, still worshipped by the Indians, because those who took me through here uh, actually made offerings of tobacco and whatever here. And it's like uh, the hunched shape of a buffalo at rest, and we call it the Buffalo Rock. But actually, it's on the way to uh, a weird sacred landscape I'll show you shortly, another type of sacred geography. But it was a sim it's a simulacrum. Um, uh, there's one a bit closer to home than uh, Manitoba. Um, it's the giant of Calm Prey. And you see it's a beautiful simulacrum. Cheekbones and nose and lips are beautiful, beautiful. And there's a legend associated with that and uh, another giant on top of another hill about six or seven miles away. Germany, uh, example, Externstein stones, these weird fingers of rock. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, chapel up there, or a pagan temple, nobody's ever figured out which. Uh, a scary little bridge over from that uh, to that. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of people throw themselves off there, a lot of suicides, so yeah, locked off now. Anyway, um, on the side here is this thing here. And it's um, a natural configuration, but it does, as you see, looks like a figure on a cross or something like that, tied to a tree, whatever. And there's debate whether it's, um, it was taken, read as uh, Christ on the cross, or Odin tied to the world tree, Yggdrasil, as he learned the secret of the runes for whatever it was, nine days and nights. And um, it's got mythology, probably from different uh, traditions. Uh, the reason we think it at least was Christianized, because there's a, what appears to be an artificial hole in its side, you know, like the spear mark on Christ. And so if so, if that's true, then this is probably the only Christianized simulacrum, natural simulacrum I know of, but who the hell knows. Anyway, over to ancient Egypt. This is Hatshepsut's uh, temple. Everybody remarks how modern and beautiful it is, and people have remarked how it's keyed in to the bottom of uh, this rock face here at Deir el-Bahari, and uh, in the, the Valley of the Kings. And people say that, oh, you know, where did the fabulous uh, culture of ancient Egypt, of dynastic Egypt, come from? Like it just appeared. Well, it didn't just appear. If you have the eyes to see, you can see how it grew out of the landscape. And this is a case in point. Nobody saw this till 1992, and then it was uh, Anthony Donahue who saw it. He realized there was a simulacrum here rising up behind the temple. And if you look carefully, you can see perhaps the outline of a, of a pharaoh with the beard, and over the top, a, a cobra with distended uh, hood. And uh, so there it is. Now, interestingly, across the river, over the Nile, on the other side, in the Temple of Karnak, they found a, a, a figurine, so high, I think it was, uh, which is just that. It shows a pharaoh with the cobra of, of, of dominion rearing over his head like that. And nobody had seen it because it's very weathered. It's, it's natural, but it may have been aided and abetted. Once Donahue had seen this, he went on and looked at other examples. So these are pre-dynastic temples here, um, uh, where you can see this has obviously been worked on, but you see a sort of proto-sphinx. And this one here, uh, underneath this rock, with, which seems to have a human profile, an old man, um, there's a temple and it's dedicated to Min that became the later Roman god Pan, the god of nature, spirit of nature. This may be artificial, but we don't know. Nobody's actually done a study of that. Anyway, Donahue's found about seven or eight temples that are linked to these simulacra along the Nile. So uh, these things seem to emerge out of the pre-dynastic landscape. Not all simulacra are of human shape and form. Uh, this is back in the Balakanchi cave I mentioned a few moments ago, 
And the simulacrum here is this remarkable fused stalactite, stalagmite, cal calcite thing. And uh, it looks, as you see, like a stone tree. And the Mayans had a tradition of a world tree. I can't pronounce the name, but anyway, they had it. And when archaeologists broke in through a rock fall here in 1959, everything had been left as it was a thousand years before. And so you find these censers and bowls, offerings and whatever were around there. And these particular ones have been left in situ. And you see it's blackened because they used to burn copal um, uh, incense here and the smoke blackened the thing. How the hell they did that? Because as I say, there's not a lot of oxygen around there. So it wouldn't have burned for long. And it wouldn't have been a good idea to hang around while they were doing it. Okay, third type of uh, sacred geography I call center place, mind, body, land. And um, it's the most difficult type to explain. If you go to, say, Delphi, uh, various Greek uh, temples, ancient Greek temples, you come across stones, not, most of them are not as elaborate as this. This one is one of the on phallus stones or navel stones at uh, Delphi and it's about, I don't know, three foot tall or whatever. And uh, this thing, the, this net, nobody quite knows what it is, there's various theories. Uh, but anyway, the point is that these on phalloi mark the center of the world. Uh, and yet every other temple has got one. This idea of the being a center was prevalent throughout the ancient world. Uh, these are the, uh, the Dogon, for example, uh, and this is their image of the center of the world, the Amphalos. It's an upturned granary basket. It's got an arrow sticking in it. Uh, it's oriented to the compass points and so on, and that's their image of a world center. We're familiar with this one, uh, the Norse uh, uh, world tree, the great ash tree, Idrasil. Uh, and it has the three worlds, the sort of heaven world, uh, the middle world, middle earth, where we hang out, and uh, the roots that go down to the underworld, the world of the ancestors and the chthonic forces. Uh, if you go to, um, should you want to go to Siberia and see the shamans there, uh, the classical shamans, some of them will have the world tree emblazoned on their ritual robes and it's traditional there they say that the the rim of their drums their shamanic drums are fashioned from the branch of a tree that stands at the golden navel of the world so again this idea now what the hell does this mean and how can there be so many different world centers well what the shamans did they beat on their drum until they went into a trance. This bloke sparked out here, you see, and they put a drum on the back, which is a sign that he's traveling, he's traveling in spirit. This bloke is well on his way by the looks of his face. And uh, he's, he's been at the vodka, I don't know which. But anyway, he's on his way. And they, they, in spirit, they flew to the world tree. All this is metaphorical language to explain how they, trans how they traveled between the worlds. So the shaman could travel up to the heaven world or down into the ancestral world, chthonic world, or fly out elsewhere in, in this world um, and perform various functions. Um, another type of certain mountains were selected by different peoples as a, a world center, a central thing. And for uh, the uh, Hindus and for the Buddhists, Mount Kailash became uh, a world mountain. Uh, much more complex than I'm saying. There's a whole bunch of stuff around this. But basically, that, that's what it is. It was a, a world mountain. Um, and this is often symbolized in the temple architecture. So here at Angkor Wat, for example, these these things here uh, represent the mountains of the corners of the world, but that centre one is Mount Meru, both a mythical and a physical mountain in this case. Uh, and Mount Meru is at the centre of the world and the pole star hangs above it. The pole star to the Tungus shamans was the nail star. It held, it held the, the universe together 
and they would, when they went into a trance, they might climb up the, uh, the tent pole, the yurt, go out through the smoke hole and fly to the nail star. All these are images about a, an axis, a cosmic axis, a world center. And I'm just trying to indicate that they come out in all sorts, even in Ireland. Uh, the Stone of Divisions, which is on the hill of Ushna, pretty much fairly central in Ireland. Uh, it's got various other names. In Pueblo Indian tradition, they have their uh, kivas, uh, uh, their ritual ceremonial chambers, semi-subterranean, and they have a little hole in it, not this thing, which is a half, but a little hole called a sipapu. And this is the point of emergence where the first people came out of the previous earth into this world. And uh, that's what it symbolizes and represents, the sipapu. This is a Hopi Indian um, altar with the four cardinal directions. And interestingly, this, a direction here that's down and a direction here which is up, again, representing the vertical axis. So you have the horizontal axis of the, of the cardinal points, the compass points, and a vertical axis. Uh, this is the uh, Beaver Indians of um, Canada who uh, have a similar sort of thing. The three worlds, you know, just like in Yggdrasil, Middle Earth, Heaven World, Underworld, and the compass directions. So what's it all about and how can there be um, a lot of centres of the world? Well, you have to think this really modelled on the human being standing in the landscape and it's a transference into the topography of this basic sense of location. The four directions, front, back and sides, your north and south, your mouth. Uh, above, sun at noon. Down below on this axis, the sun at midnight. And you have uh, the image of the body, if you like, projected onto the land. And the reason you can have uh, a lot of world centers, because each of you are in your world center now. Every one of you has a circuit around you. And there's six billion world centers, or whatever the count is lately in the world. So that's, that's, the, that's the, the image that works about it. And the good thing to remember, because you're at the center of the world, you're always here, wherever you are, even if you're over there, just take the tea off and here you are. So always remember that. It's re I find it reassuring, even when I get lost, uh, which is often. Uh, okay, the next type of uh, sacred geography is the geography of pilgrimage, walking through holy lands. Himalayan pilgrimage, there we are, back at Mount Kailash again. Uh, as I say, Buddhist, uh, Hindu, uh, and long before them, I suspect, a, a, a Bompo tradition, a, an earth religion tradition. And we know there's this big uh, pilgrimage circuit around the world mountain. In the Stone Age, it's been suggested by uh, Roy Loveday, an archaeologist, he's been looking at uh, Henges like this in parts of, of northern England that have double entrance. These are Neolithic features. Uh, they're ceremonial features. They're not, they're not um, fortifications. But they have two entrances. And he lined up some of the entrances of different ones. And he suddenly realized he was looking at a pilgrimage trail. And it, I, very interesting, much, much later Roman roads echo these routes. Uh, like there was a route that was well known 2,000 years earlier, uh, and it, the, route, the route is a very interesting thing, the way a road goes. The road itself might be quite recent. Uh, we've got one near our place. It's a, it's a Roman road. The actual Roman surface is four feet down um, beneath the present surface. So a route is an intangible thing. It's like an axis of a global, you have a, a, a globe, you know, spinning. Uh, the axis doesn't actually exist. It's not tangible, yet it's really there. And root, routeways are a bit like this. So it's quite possible that these things were part of a whole pilgrimage tradition in the Neolithic. Whereabouts is that? I, I think this one particular one, hey, I just pulled the picture out. Um, I think it's Thornborough, actually, one of the Thornborough henges. But there are many more of double entrance henges. 
Then you have uh, Hindu faith scapes, another type of pilgrimage thing. And um, this one here, Braj, India, is a, is a Krishna landscape. Uh, what the pilgrims do, they walk around this very large area on a particular route. And in some places, at certain times of the year, they actually have people performing underneath a tree or in a particular grove a, uh, a scene from the life of Krishna. And so you actually visit, you follow the mythography of Krishna in the physical landscape. And the pilgrimage route represents that and will stop you at certain places and whatever. And certain places you shouldn't get to until certain times of day because you don't want to disturb the spirit of Krishna who's having a bit of nucky in, in one corner over there or is asleep somewhere else. And it's, it's, uh, it's uh, beautifully or it's orchestrated geography. Uh, and this, of course, familiar to us all, the bathing in the Ganges of Varanasi or Benares. Uh, but less well known is that I think there's, it's like 52 circuits, pilgrimage circuits around. Um, and uh, some you do at certain times of the year and not others. And the, the Hindus, they call them faithscapes, which I think is a wonderful phrase. Christian pilgrimage, well, too many to mention, really, but we'll go to an early one, Mount Sinai um, uh, in Egypt. And um, again, this is an orchestrated journey through the landscape. So you stop at certain points where you can see the mountain or some significant feature. Um, uh, a way you would stop and perhaps cut off your hair or whatever, some make some offering. Uh, so it's highly orchestrated. And then one of the greatest uh, Christian pilgrimages, of course, is that of Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain. And uh, people came from all over Europe to this, still do actually, from all over the world. And then there's an organized, particularly organized route to the shrine. And again, there are stops on the way, the field of stars, various other things where events, legendary events, were said to occur. So it's a mythologized landscape with an orchestrated route through it, which is the best way to describe pilgrimage, I guess. And then perhaps the most famous pilgrimage of all, the Hajj, uh, the, the circuit of the Kaaba, uh, which contains what is possibly and probably a meteoric stone, uh, the tawaf, the, the circulation of that, but less well known to a lot of non-Muslims is that that's only a bit of, bit of, the, of the pilgrimage journey. There's a, a controlled uh, movement through the landscape to outlying places, each of them having meaning in the life of uh, Muhammad uh, and so on. And, and uh, you know, it, it takes a day or two to do the whole thing. Um, and um, another image of the uh, of pilgrimage. I'll give two, a couple of examples of, of Native American pilgrimage because very little is known about those. This particular one is a human Indian pilgrimage circuit. Can I find it? It goes up the Colorado River Valley uh, up here, uh, sort of. And it... Um, actually goes up there and it reaches it, it starts near a place a hill a mountain called Mount uh, Pilot Knob almost on the uh, oh here we are uh, almost on the, uh, the the Mexican border and it follows up as you go along and uh, the end point uh, in just the southern tip of Nevada is uh, what's called a dead mountain. Dead man, that's not snow, that's bare rock. It's a bald mountain. And the Indians called it Avikwami, or, or spirit mountain. And shamans, rain shamans, would come from perhaps 400 miles away to this place. Uh, and ordinary Indians, as it were, would do their pilgrimage up to it periodically. And uh, they didn't actually go to the top of the mountain. Uh, this was the point they, they came to. It's called Grapevine Canyon. And when you get inside the canyon, you find it's absolutely loaded with rock art everywhere. No, rock art, rock art. This symbol here, the big horn sheep, you'll find everywhere when you go there and look. And the big horn sheep was the symbol of the rain shaman. The whole thing about killing a big horn sheep and producing rain, um, metaphorically. And then there's all this stuff here 
which seems to be geometric imagery, the cane, because a lot of what they did, they take a Datura mix when they got there, very powerful, mind-altering, psychoactive thing, and they commune, and this place was said to be uh, the house of a particular creator god. And as I say, the, they came from all over across the Great Basin and so on into this for untold hundreds of years. We don't know how long. But some of the rock art's very ancient. Some of it's more recent. The last known rain shaman to go there was 1948, actually. Was the last one. Another example is this thing here, a, a pilgrimage to this very big rock, big as a house, big as a big house. Uh, and it's called Ayers Rock. No, not the one in uh, Australia, but in California. And when you get up to it, apart from being very, very big, uh, you find this fabulous rock art on it. And this one, of, oh, actually, of a shaman. His eyes are hollows. And uh, these are sort of spirit familiars, spirit helpers. Uh, but as you go round this vast rock, much bigger than it looks, um, uh, you find little areas of paintings and so on. And certain shamans might sit in certain niches of the rock. And again, they came from all along the California Sierras uh, to this place. So it was another pilgrimage point. A, a still current pilgrimage, because none of these are now current, but one that is current is the pilgrimage of the, the annual pilgrimage of the Huishol Indians to the Virikutar Plateau, where they collect um, peyote in baskets uh, and, and eventually take it back to their home about 300 miles away and uh, then use it through the year for ritual sacramental purposes uh, but they also use the the peyote while they're up there and certain rituals are conducted and it's known as a great hunt and the uh, the peyote becomes a deer it's complicated stuff but anyway it's a it's a fabulous pilgrimage and I heard a couple of years ago that the poor devils, on their way back, were stopped by the police for carrying drugs. Been doing it for hundreds of years, you know, per lease. Okay, another type, very mysterious type of sacred geography are lines. Lines drawn in the land, the secrets of straightness. And immediately when we talk about these sort of things, we think of Nazca. Uh, and here's some of the Nazca lines in Peru. Um, and these lines all over the place are very straight. Uh, some are very fine, narrow, some are quite broad, and some are sort of trapezoid in, in shape. Um, so we have an air view here with a great big area, like an airfield there, and then thinner, finer lines coming in. And here's a view at ground level of these things. There's another one here, you can see the, the edges of something here, and then you see that going on up there. And sometimes when you're on the ground, they're not that clear. So here's an example of looking along a line, and you see because the rocks have moved with winds or whatever over the ages, uh, but where, at a distance you can see the lines more easily. So we have that sort of thing. And then we say, well, what are these lines? Well, we'll come back to that. Actually, over in uh, Bolivia on the Altiplano, um, there are longer lines, more lines, um, much more than Nazca. So what's, what are they about? Well, okay, the, the, Nazca's famous because of the best-selling books of von Daniken who said that they were landing strips for alien craft. Please. It's, it, it's, it was a mid-20th century mechanistic projection onto what these things were, because initially they weren't apparent what they were. We didn't know. Uh, now it's pretty clear that they are a spirit geography, a sacred geography, because if you look at some of, quite a lot of the, of the Nazca lines, they've been warped. Warped, warped, warped deep ruts, apparently from nowhere and to nowhere that's meaningful to us, but obviously was to them. Uh, and it, there was a place called Kawachi, which uh, is, seems to have been a pilgrimage center related to at least some of the lines. Uh, some of the lines are related to water sources and so on, but clearly they were more than that. They were, they were non-mundane ways through the landscape. 
Now, I've done quite a bit of work in the Americas on these things, and I've got to tell you, the straight lines are almost everywhere in pre-Columbian... Uh, they're finding them in the Amazon now, for example. I've been doing for actually for a few years. Um, and it was uh, the anthropologist, uh, Marlene Dobkin de Rios, who suggested, well, she said, look at the, these, these are the Nazcan lines, you know, 1,000, 1,500 years old, maybe even a bit older. And if you look at the pottery of that time, you get pick figures like this, what they call the flying god of Paracas. And uh, he seems to be flying along happily, his hair streaming out, holding something rather mushroom-like. What we do know is that all the people of the Andes took a hell of a lot of psychoactive drugs. No doubt about it, a lot. They find snuff paraphernalia for uh, psychoactive snuffs, drinks, cacti or San Pedro cacti, Chavin to Huanta, uh, and it was located with two things. One was spirit flight, and, and the other was transformation into animals, the sense of transforming, bodily transformation. Uh, this is in the Amazon, a winged figures carved on the rock, and this is a woodblock from uh, medieval Europe, uh, which is flying on a broomstick, of course, they're, they're flying ointments, psychoactive herbs mixed into goose fat, and so forth. So uh, it looks more likely that the, um, the lines are to do with this idea of, of, of other world travel. And we had this confirmed with the work um, on the Kogi Indians of northern Colombia, uh, you may have seen the fabulous uh, BBC documentary, it's now available on DVD, uh, The Heart of the World, uh, by Alan Herrera. And um, it shows these images. Uh, and on the edge of one, the, the, these are the, uh, the shamans, if you like, the mamas of the Kogi Indians. And their basic training, traditional training, is that as a young child, if they, they use divination a lot, uh, mainly using bubbles uh, in bowls of water. And if they identify a child as uh, being mama material, as it were, it just means enlightened ones, um, they, they take him away and put him inside a cave where the child would not see daylight again, perhaps for some years. Uh, they massaged him to keep his, his muscles supple, or whatever, uh, and he would be kept in the dark, he would be trained in the way of, of the mamas, and uh, after a little while, like a few years, he might be taken outside, but only taken outside at night, and he'd wear a big hat, big rimmed hat, so the, the moon didn't shine, he didn't see it directly, and he didn't see the stars, he just saw the moonlit landscape. And then finally, there's a fabulous bit in the film where they, they recreate this, uh, finally, the, the kid is taken out, the young initiate, when he starts rocking backwards and forwards and singing certain songs, that's always a sign that he's there, he's in the other world, uh, or can see, or is in touch with the other world. And uh, they take him out into the broad daylight, and remember, he hasn't seen any luck, and the light blasts into his eyes. And they say, from that moment, he can see the physical world but he can see the other world that they call a lunar, the dream world, superimposed one on the other. And these people are the descendants of the Tyronus culture, which flourished. Uh, it, it, its fluorescence came when they discovered magic mushrooms. And they've got little gold amulets and things with little mushrooms on. And that became sacramental to them. And um, there's, there's this map stone near one of the Tyronus towns, covered in these lines, as you see. And these lines mark the, uh, these roads. And the, the ordinary tribal members are told that it's a religious duty to walk, walk, walk these roads. Think of the tracks in, on Nazca. Walk, walk the roads, like we might tell rosary beads if you're a if you're a Catholic or something like that. That was their religious activity, duty. Uh, but these, these lines mark not only these physical roads, but at certain points the physical roads end, but the mama can see them continuing on in a lunar in the other world. 
So they're spirit roads. And, and what the physical roads are, are physical traces of part of these other world routes. So we probably have here a living tradition uh, that tells us quite a bit about what the old lines were ultimately about. Um, uh, the Tyronus Trust is there, tyronustrust.org. They're under constant risk, these people. And, and so uh, they ask for help and funding and so on to keep them clear as much as possible. And then these sort of simple desert lines in more structured, hierarchical American cultures, American Indian cultures, uh, became sort of ceremonial ways. This is a Mayan causeway or a sack bay. Um, this happens to be in Chichen Itza, but there are many others. They're cut dead straight through, through the forest, through the jungle. And there's all sorts of legends and traditions about these ways. Here's some more near a place called Sail. There's one that's the course of one. Another one here leading up to a feature in Sail. The longest one of these causeways, Mayan causeways, uh, starts out from here, this pyramid in Kobar, which is like there, and it runs for 60 odd miles straight to Yashuna, another ritual uh, ceremonial city. Now I've traced parts of this, and it starts off as a nice causeway because it's been reconstructed, but it quickly descends into what's left, and it's a, a jumble of stones and rocks that you have to peer through the the jungle undergrowth to see, so still do, but it's, it's traceable and has been traced. NASA's done quite a bit of work here using LIDAR photography and uh, infrared photography, so these routes are traced through the jungle. And I've talked to one of the great uh, archaeologists there who has spent 40 years with the Mayans tracing and tracking and mapping these, these roads. Uh, there's the tradition of the Kusam Sun, which is uh, an invisible sack bay, one that runs through the air like a tube, and uh, there's another that runs under the ground that links all the ceremonial ball courts of the Mayan ceremonial cities and so on. So there's like a whole network, and we've come across these virtual or invisible networks elsewhere in the Americas, and um, I've got to move on. Um, anyway, they all took mushrooms and stuff like that. La Comada in northern uh, uh, Mexico, Zacatecas, a citadel. Nobody really knows too much about it or the people who used it. Uh, but around it are these straight road systems. You can see these lines here. Um, and if you go up onto the, the citadel and look out, you can just see the traces of some of them like that. So this is a mysterious, sacred um, geography. This is Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. This is um, uh, one of the great houses on the floor uh, of, the, of the canyon. And the, these roads coming into or going out of, um, of Chaco, you see some coming in here. Uh, once upon a time, they were very visible. This photograph was taken in 1901, and you can see they're very big. These people, the Anasazi who built this, uh, had neither wheeled vehicles nor horses. Um, so why do you build a footpath that wide, eh? Uh, when it comes to the rim rock of the, of the canyon, uh, there are these uh, remains, heavily eroded uh, ceremonial staircases down into the floor. A lot more I could tell you. Stuff here, this one is 1,600-year-old line in the Gila River Valley in southern um, Mexico. <laughs> sorry, southern Arizona. Uh, this is the Vision Quest ring. That, that's the course of the line. There's a rock at the other end with a, a notch in it, uh, and you can see the sacred, a sacred mountain there. And the Pima Indian shaman, the ancestral Pima, would take their Datura mix, sit here during uh, midwinter night, and then as the sun rose over there, they'd leave their bodies as they would go into this psychoactive out-of-body state, fly along the line to the mountain to meet the spirits. We have them here too, something like this, these curious linear features known as cursuses. There's about a hundred of them been found by aerial photography. This one's a mile long, it goes on up there. They seem to link places of the dead. Uh, they're Neolithic. This is Bronze Age. 
uh, stone rows sort of thing you see on Dartmoor like this one and elsewhere. Uh, and then we have the idea of fairy paths, very strong in Celtic countries. Fairy paths in Ireland, paths of the dead in Brittany, for example. And they link certain sites called raths, which are late prehistoric uh, structures. This is a famous one uh, in County Mayo. Uh, various markers along them, like uh, fairy trees. There seems to be one at Latoon near Ennis. And then throughout medieval Europe, there was this idea of um, virtual ways, invisible routes, along which uh, spirits would walk. But you couldn't see them, but they had a definite geography. And you made sure you didn't walk on them at night, because you might encounter something you don't want to encounter. But what they did, they linked physical cemeteries. Uh, but there were these paths of the dead. Then uh, there were physical paths. Uh, this one, for example, the old Hell Way on Yorkshire, which were corpse ways or funeral paths for carrying the dead uh, to burial. Uh, in, in Holland, they're called Dode Wagen or Spoken Wagen um, um, spook roads because these things became associated with the much older spirit law that existed in, in Europe. And it's expressed by the old bard himself in uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now it is that time of night of the graves all gaping wide. Everyone lets forth his sprite in the churchway paths to glide. So we knew that tradition, the idea of spirits moving down and the spirit traps put on some of these roads and so on. Incidentally, if you want to read the full story of this, uh, uh, I think uh, Roma Harding on her uh, bookstall has my spirit roads where we go into all this thoroughly. Um, and uh, I haven't got any copies, but she's managed to find some somewhere. There are other lines that do not relate to the, to the spirits, out-of-body spirits or spirits of the dead or spirits of nature. We don't know what they are. This is Ty Creek. Uh, you pass that buffalo rock on the way to this. Scraped, uh, glacially scraped bedrock. And these curious, probably about 1,500-year-old uh, boulder patterns or petroforms, as they're known, uh, extraordinary things. The Indians call them Manito Arbi, where God or the Great Spirit sits. And of course, it's where Manitoba gets its name from. So these are very curious features. <coughs> Another odd feature, again, uh, near that pilgrimage route up uh, the Colorado River Valley, um, uh, full of lines. And these lines were used for ritual running. Uh, the American, Native American braves did run and run and run. Till, literally till they dropped. Sometimes they died, and it was get, to get into other states of consciousness. Wonderful record of some of the visions some of the runners had. Then if you go to outer places like Death Valley and to some of the remote locations, uh, and you know where to look, there are very ancient pathways. This one created simply by the removal of the volcanic rock litter. Others that are just dead odd things that are built uh, that are probably magical uh, active, result from magical activity by the Pima Indian ancestral Indians about 2,000 years ago. Uh, we have some ethnology on that. Giants in the Earth, another type of highly related, um, in many cases highly related sacred geography, the famous uh, Serpent Mound, for example, in Ohio. Uh, it's about four or five feet tall. There's no burials or anything in it, just a serpent mound. Uh, very interesting. Uh, the Hopewell Indians pr produced loads of, of pure, beautiful geometric earthworks. Hexagons, circles, all sorts of geometric shapes. And long straight road. There's one that cuts almost all the way across Ohio, for example. We know the Hopewell people actually were a, a confederation of tribes, but they all subscribed to a shamanism that centred on the use of... Uh, magical mushrooms and uh, th these antler head and uh, this wooden model of a mushroom was found in a shaman's grave. Death Valley, strange imagery laid out in petroforms very much like um, uh, uh, Manitoba. Then uh, in northern upper Midwest, Wisconsin, Iowa and so on, there are these effigy mounds, some of which look like crosses between human beings and birds. Again, probably to do with the idea of spirit fly. This is a 1912 photograph of one of the great images in Wisconsin. It's been outlined with flour, so you can see it. Damn difficult to photograph at ground level. 
From the air uh, in Iowa, you've got all these images, mainly abstract, but some things like this bear, which is about 300 feet long, and uh, which will give you a scale, but lots of circles and other shapes and so on. Um, these birds, this bird here outlined in the snow is this one here. And uh, a lot of stuff, you know. Um, and that, that human Indian pilgrimage trail that I mentioned um, is uh, a periodic points along it are giant geoglyphs, big markings of animal or human figures. These posts are five feet high to give you some sort of a scale. Uh, and there's lots of them. Well, I say lots, but there's quite a few. Dating seems to go back to about 3,000 years ago. I'm going to skip a lot of stuff now. Uh, mapping the monuments, you're all familiar with that anyway. Stone circles put at exact points that within 100 yards, if you move this stone circle on Bodmi more this way a bit, you wouldn't see uh, Brown Willy there, the distant um, uh, natural sites. Uh, this is uh, Gorse Vow Stone Circle in Priscelli. That is the Card Menin outcrop there. And again, you see it's on the skyline. Actually, if you go to the Hurlers uh, on Bodmin Moor, uh, on the skyline there is the Cheese Ring, the natural tour. And we know about archaeoastronomy, so I won't go into that. Then the soundscapes. Well, we did sound this morning. Uh, but I'd mention a couple of interesting other aspects of acoustics. Uh, these are the Arapesh people in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and these are members of the men's uh, secret society, the Tambaran. And Donald Tuzin, who, who lived with them for a while, anthropologist, noted these curious instruments that they have. Some of them are like 15 feet long often put the sort of tubes that, that fit into a slit drum at the end, various other things. And at certain times, they all gather together, bring out the secret instruments, and start playing them, blowing in them, whatever they do. And he said this unearthly sound comes up out of the forest, and they're supposed to be the voices of the forest spirits. But he said, there's some other element going on here. He said, it really gets through to you. And what he found out was they, they started doing this activity when there were thunderstorms about 12 miles away. And he said you couldn't hear the thunder, but he was pretty sure the infrasound from the thunder was rolling through their landscape. And these things sort of rode the infrasonic waves through the landscape. Um, and he said it gave the most powerful and eerie experience you could imagine. The Buddhists, uh, especially Shingon Buddhism, were very into uh, landscapes that spoke uh, with the cosmic language of the Buddha. This is how um, Grappard put it. Waves, pebbles, winds, and winds. Sorry, pebbles, winds, and birds. The elementary and unconscious performers of the cosmic speech of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. Uh, this happens to be Mount uh, Nantai and Lake Chizenji. Uh, and the temple at Chizenji uh, was noted by Kukai, founder of, of Shingon Buddhism. He said, all this landscape speaks with the voice of the Buddha if you listen to the natural sounds. And that was a similar thing with uh, the Kunisaki Peninsula in Japan. Uh, and that was in Japan, of course. And uh, the Kunisaki Peninsula is very interesting because it's got all these radial valleys coming out, as you see there. This is the sea. Not a very clear picture. And as you wander around, you'll, you'll see rock carvings and so on. Um, and it was said that it's basically the Lotus Scroll in landscape form. There are so many valleys as there are verses in the Lotus Scroll uh, and whatever. And just walking and listening to the babbling brooks or the bird song or whatever is the equivalent of reading the Lotus Scroll. So this idea of, uh, remember the, the two van um, throat singers had a similar idea. Uh, and then in, in, in the book that's coming out, the Sacred Geography book, I also go into Enchanted Gardens, and I mentioned a little of that with the acoustics. Uh, this is a Zen garden, which is uh, a sort of miniature landscape, but some Zen gardens also use the greater landscape. And uh, we think there's probably an acoustic dimension there as well. But this will be the book. It's supposed to be out next month, but, you know, we'll publishers like it's now been pushed back till... Um, uh, October and uh, if you're really interested in this stuff lots and lots of pictures and, and proper 
reference stuff, what I've just babbled at you to keep within the thing. So, what, what does it teach? Well, it's no good. We don't want to create these landscapes uh, now, but they do teach us something. This idea I mentioned at the beginning of investing the land with mythic meaning. Uh, and in a way, we're doing it now, like the Bellimus line and the St. Michael line and that thing. They're projections onto the land, I have to tell you. Uh, but um, they, they is a way of sort of seeking meaning in our modern world. I would like us to seek something a bit richer and more deeply rooted myself. Uh, but anyway, it's the same idea of investing the land, the waters, uh, the, the sky with meaning. And uh, if we could do that, see, as we know, our, our culture, the mainstream culture, only sees land and these things as utilities, things we can draw oil from, uh, or uh, uh, I've got rocks you can use and grind down and make roads with and so on. And, and so we have a utilitarian thing with the landscape, but Aboriginal peoples, ancient peoples, also invested the land with these, these, these spiritual aspects. And I guess if we could do that as a whole culture today, if the whole Western culture could do it, then we'd look after that landscape a little better. And our sacred geography is now global, and we have to think of it in that rounded way, whereas other people only had relatively small territories to invest with their mythology and, and spirituality. But we need to do that now. We do know this, this idea of, of treating the earth as a sacred thing come through the Gaia hypothesis and so on, and the people are becoming aware of that. But it's still a long, long way from reaching the ears of the corporate world and the political world. Uh, so the sooner we can get them to invest meaning in the land, in the globe, the safer we'll all be. Okay, thank you.